Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on proof of concept funds, case studies, and on goals and operations. My name is Kirsten Loita, and I'm a partner here at Osage University Partners, leading our university relations efforts. Go to the next slide. We have four expert guest panelists today. I'm really pleased to have them here, and I'll have each of them joining us uh, introduce themselves. Jamie, could you lead off our introductions? Sure. I'm Jamie Testa. I'm the best practices manager here at OEP, and I get to I have the privilege of getting to look at all the amazing things all our great university partners are doing, including proof of concept funds today. Great. Ryan. I'm oh, Brian. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, I'm Ryan. Yes. <laughs> I'm Ryan Buckmaster. I'm the Associate Director of Innovation Investments at University of Washington CoMotion, our tech transfer office. Uh, so I oversee our GAP fund, uh, run our mentor program, and also provide teams of support for SBIR programs. Yeah, before that, I was a technology manager for a good number of years, and my colleagues think it's very fitting I now oversee our GAP fund since I probably had the most teams who went through it when I was a technology manager. Thanks, Alexandra. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. I'm Alexandra DePaz, and I'm the Associate Director of New Ventures um, with our Innovation and New Ventures Fund, also known as INVO um, at Northwestern University. This is our technology transfer office, and I broadly help support our research-based and faculty-based startups um, at Northwestern um, through providing various commercialization, commercialization education type programs, um, entrepreneurial training opportunities, and perhaps most relevant to this discussion by leading our university gap fund called the next fund um, and prior to being um, with invo i actually got my synthetic biology focused phd at northwestern great and brian from jhu hi brian stansky johns hopkins technology ventures i lead fast forward which is the startup arm i also oversee our transitional funding programs great thanks so much brian um, Alexandra, Ryan, and Jamie, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, as I ask questions today, I'll make sure to say Ryan from UW or Ryan from JHU, since your names are so similar. We'll go to the next slide. Before we get into the main substance of our uh, webinar, just a few housekeeping items, the slides and a recording of this webinar. This is a very common question we get, so I'm answering this now. Uh, a slide, the slides and recording of this webinar will be available on OUP's partner portal, and a recording will also be available via our um, YouTube channel, which is public. Uh, the partner portal is an online portal for the tech transfer officers and researchers at our partner universities that's full of relevant tech transfer and startup content. Uh, if you don't already um, have a partner portal account, you can register for one, and once you are in the portal, you will need, um, uh, you'll find a downloadable presentation deck and a video link in there under um, the webinars page, which is under our startup resources section. Um, this is only available to our uh, partner institutions, um, but again, there will be a um, version of this also available on our YouTube channel. We do have a number of upcoming webinars uh, in uh, June and August. Our first is on uh, June 27th, which is our fifth installment in our funding and equity webinar series. This time we're going to be focusing um, on cap tables and exits, uh, the calculations behind them and how exits play out on those cap tables. Um, in August, we have a webinar uh, that's going to be case studies for our patient data licensing series that we've been doing. And we'll also have our sixth installment um, of our funding and equity webinar series. Where we'll be talking about boards and board seats. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to put a quick plug in for Equalize, um, which is uh, having its culmination event on June 29th. Equalize is a program designed to take national action uh, around the disparity of women academic inventors forming university startups. This is a half year program that includes advice from industry leaders, education about entrepreneurship and networking event. We have 23 participants this year who will be pitching on uh, June 29th, but there's also some other events that are associated with June 29th that you can see here are welcome and keynote presentation by Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia from MIT. And then we'll have a panel discussion on funding in a challenging economic, economic environment uh, with our um, esteemed panelists, uh, Rima, Rich, and Nancy from different venture funds that you can see there. You can find out more information about the Equalize program and please re register. It's open to anyone uh, and come cheer on uh, the participants from this year's program as well. Also feel free to follow up with us if you have any questions about this program. We'll go on to the next slide. 
We, um, oh, I did forgot to, I forgot to mention before we got to here, uh, we do encourage uh, questions throughout this webinar. Uh, we'll use the Q&A tool in the, uh, in Zoom. You can probably find that in your lower toolbar to submit your questions. Uh, please don't use the chat. Uh, I do review all the questions as we go along and the Q&A tool makes it a lot easier for me to keep track of those questions. A quick outro to um, uh, OUP for those of you who don't know us, we're a venture capital fund that partners with academic institutions to invest in their startups, typically by exercising participation rights available through their licenses. As a part of this partnership, the institutions share in our profits and receive programmatic support on tech transfer and academic startups. We're now on our fourth fund and have made over 130 investments uh, in areas of uh, deep sciences, actually in 130 different companies, I should say, in areas of deep science. Uh, and many of those companies have had successful exits, either through IPOs or merger and acquisition. The next slide shows some of our portfolio companies and the breadth of areas we invest in. We're always happy to talk about our model, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. But our focus of, of today is on these proof of concept funds. And Jamie's going to do a few intro slides on the area that will then lead into the case studies on operations and goals. So Jamie, I'll pass it on to you. Perfect. Um, next slide. So yeah, so thanks, Kirsten. And before our three amazing panelists discuss their specific university proof of concept funds, I just wanted to level set a little bit about what is a proof of concept fund. So proof of concept funds are typically grants that de-risk a technology, and this can help a technology meet milestones that will increase its potential to be licensed to an existing company or enable the formation of a startup. And these milestones can be anything. They could be additional data. They could be prototypes. It really depends on what is needed to de-risk the technology. And then also these milestones are typically agreed upon when the funding is provided. And then also these funds can help identify a weakness in the technology. That might sound like a negative, but it's really a positive. When you can identify the weakness this early on, it helps de-risk a technology and prevents you from um, doing that for farther product and farther product development. And then these PRC funds are about more than the funding. It's about more than the money. A lot of these funds offer additional resources. So that could be training components for faculty and staff about commercialization. It could be additional support. So some funds offer something say like access to CRO um, services. And then a lot of funds have a pool of mentors that help advise their teams. And then these POC funds impact the entrepreneurial and economic development efforts of the university. So these projects can lead to new startups being launched, which can lead to job creation in your local or state ecosystem. But also since you're de-risking these technologies and moving these projects along, they tend to attract follow-on funding. That could be in the form of federal grants like STTR or SBIR or venture funding if it enables the formation of a startup. Next slide. Now I'd really be remiss if I didn't mention the Mind the Gap report from Source. Um, Jacob Johnson, who's the founder, has done an excellent job compiling, I think it's over seven year, 17 years worth of data and almost 100 universities about their gap funding programs, including proof of concept um, funds. And really, when I was starting my research in proof of concept funds, this was my go to source um, to start off at. And the website's there. So really, you know, if after listening to the case studies today, you want to do a bit of a deeper dive into proof of concept funds. This is a great place to start and visit the website and look at all that Jacob is doing. Um, next slide. And then I also just want to mention the resources that OUP has put together on proof of concept funds. So on that partner portal that Kirsten had mentioned, if you go under our startup, the startup research page, we have a proof of concept funds list. Um, as you can see on the left um, side of the slide. Once again, this list was is updated. Um, we updated it about the second half of last year, and we have about 60 universities that list um, their proof of concept funds on it. But I will admit, I've learned that this field is really dynamic and there's new proof of concept funds being formed every day, or your universities are modifying their funds based on what their university needs. So if you see anything on there, my fund's not on there, or, oh, you should change that, Jamie, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be at the end of the deck. And then also on the right-hand side, um, in November 2021, I wrote a short blog on proof of concept funds. It's a really quick read. It'll take you less than five minutes. But if you're thinking uh, you'd really want to know some examples of universities that are maybe offering those additional resources, 
I give a good shout out to a bunch of universities um, that you can see within that blog. Um, and before we head on to the next, um, and I just want to mention quick, the blog um, link is on the bottom of this, or you could go to oup.vc um, and our insight page to find it. And before I move on, we move on to the next panelist, I just want to mention that uh, one of the things we would like to do at OEP is share some success stories. So what I mean is if you had a startup, that a successful startup that spun out of your POC fund, shoot me an email, like I said, contact information at the end of the deck, and we can talk about how to best share that story. Um, but that's it for me. So on to the next. Which I believe is Ryan. Ryan. All right. Thank Ryan you. From UW. All right. Well, it's good to be here, everyone. I'm going to tell you about the uh, Commotion Innovation Gap Fund, which is the University of Washington's Gap Fund, which has existed in several different formats since uh, 2005. Yeah, next slide, please. So the University of Washington, uh, our goal at Commotion is really to support the uh, UW community to help people move their ideas forward. Um, we do that by, by offering a wide range of uh, services. And although our focus is generally strongest on university owned innovations. We do interact with uh, other groups, especially we have an i -Core site program and our incubators also open to uh, um, non-UW startups. But I think probably the trend is probably more and more regional focus seems to be where uh, tech transfer is headed. Uh, next, please. So we do try to, our vision is that really innovation is a journey. So we try to offer different programs kind of on a as needed basis when everything from training, which has been more and more a focus of everything we do. Of course, things like IP protection, funding, mentoring, and then of course, eventually getting people off in the startups if that's the direction they're going. Uh, probably this road deck should actually have a lot more people going backwards at times, but uh, there's definitely lots of twists and turns. Next, please. So I mentioned the Innovation Gap Fund. It's been around for 18 years. It certainly did not start off what looking like today. Initially, it was literally a grant program, which I think the even blinded name of the applicants to avoid undue influence. Uh, then it came much more external reviewers drawn from the entrepreneurial community, doing pitching, slides were banned at one point, uh, education came in, I unbanned slides. So we are always tweaking, uh, so it's evolved. But one thing that's consistent is our goal really is to help move innovations to the market whether that's a startup, uh, some sort of captive enterprise at university offering services or as a uh, direct license to a company. Um, and one goal also, we want to try to find if, but if for this funding type moments where it can really advance a project to the next inflection point and help continue getting resources. Since we really don't want to fund something and just have it get stuck again, lacking the funding. And one change over time really has been focused less from assessment of projects to more trying to provide educational focus, really trying to teach the teams to fish and give them entrepreneurial skills and the commercial mindset. So even if this doesn't work out, the next thing, they might have the skills to really uh, take something forward. Or if they go on to somewhere else, especially at graduate students and postdocs that help further their career interest from having this experience. Uh, next, please. So uh, where our fund kind of sits is um, ideally people go through something like our i -Core site program or a short version, one day version we do for faculty. That doesn't always happen. Um, but this is gonna really consider pretty early on where things are definitely can be early stage. Sometimes this is the first time people thought about things in commercialization uh, way, although definitely teams that go through i -Core are about twice as successful at getting funded. So uh, that does make a big difference. It is a steep learning curve we found. But some people do manage to climb that, even if it's really their first foray into thinking about commercialization. And then this tends to set people up then for a later state, in the next stage of funding, um, or a partner foundation, Washington Research Foundation has grants that are positioned a little bit later. They really like people to go through this grant. We have a REACH grant. It also tends to be, really assumes that you've kind of figured out the basics. Uh, SBIRs are common. We also see uh, things like yeah, the PFI grants from the NSF, angels and in more cases sometimes VCs depending if the technology really uh, measures up but uh, hopefully we get people to the next stage of some sort of uh, commercialization funding. Uh, next please. So the details about our fund is uh, probably one of its defining features is we pair people up with an industry mentor as they work through it. Uh, we do try to pick uh, people who have uh, some knowledge in the uh, particular uh, industry area. 
all those nines, that is challenging because we tend to get, get a lot of uh, life science oriented projects and they not always have that many mentors in that area. I mentioned our focus really is on teaching people a lot of skills and uh, knowledge. Customer discovery is emphasized, go talk to people. It's not a real hard, big lift, but sometimes that is something of a revelation to people. And we do offer this twice a year, every fall and spring. So that there's a pretty rapid cadence. So people have a chance if they're the time you aligns to make a go for it, or if they fail, they can come back next time without waiting too long. The actual awards are typically $50,000. Uh, this is since actually for the last 18 years, it's been $50,000. And uh, the way it's structured currently is up to $40,000 can be used for technical development and $10,000 must be used for business development work. So business development as often teams don't know what that means and it's pretty common for them to not actually have a real clear plan and that's fine. We can talk about some of those things a bit later, what does fall into that. Although we're pretty open if people want to do more business development um, in a perfect world perhaps uh, that would actually be half the funds, although I'm not sure if people, our audience would quite go for that, but uh, that is, we consider it an important part of the funding. Uh, next, please. Can I actually oh, yes. ask a yeah, quick please. question, Ryan? Um, so for the technical development, uh, do you um, include salaries for postdocs and grad students also in that technical development or do you exclude that? We, we include that. That's a very common use of the money. We do exclude faculty salary. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit about what the people actually do. So it's kind of a guided educational experience or maybe kind of a really low intensity startup experience. So we have the UW Innovator team. Often uh, we do have uh, graduate students or postdocs often are actually the lead person doing the grant, but we also have faculty members who are in that position. Uh, so then, uh, next, please. So then we uh, pair the mentor. Also, the tech managers are part of the team. Although we try to design the program so the tech managers don't have to do a lot of the management. So we the fun. We do all the reminders and the logistics of it. And um, often the teams and the the mentors uh, really kind of handle most of the activities on their own. Oh, okay. And what we have the teams do. So after they put an initial profile, which is a pretty low bar, this done our the system that we use to manage it. They just need to, let's say, what they're working on and who they are. Uh, first task, that once we pair them with mentors, just do a lean canvas. Give it a shot, fill it out. We have some uh, documentation videos on how to do that. But it's really considered as a starting point, and they'll be asked to revise this several times so they put in additional uh, uh, deliverables. OK, next. So after that, we encourage people then to stop, step back and think looking at their canvas, what do they know and not know, and to do a bit of customer discovery. So initially make up a plan of who, the, at least we asked 20 people, some questions of what they really want to go ask them. And then uh, next, a few weeks later, they'll turn in a summary of their findings. Our minimum is at least five uh, contacts been made, which is, uh, that's, I think just the beginning, often getting signal and customer discovery. Some teams do a lot more, especially ones who've gone through iCore, often they have over 20 or 30. Uh, interviews that often say that teams do uh, get some initial validation or sometimes some mixed signals, which is also valuable. Okay, next please. And then we have teams do a pitch practice. So with uh, our mentors, they'll come in. It's uh, really kind of designed to help people improve their ability to tell stories that for investment style pitch they're gonna give. Also feedback of like maybe glaring holes they might want to try to address and advice. So these are often actually very good sessions since the Mentors often have a lot of experience and giving these sorts of pitches. And I see, often I see the teams from the practice pitch to the final pitch, actually enormous improvement often does happen. Okay, and finally, the teams do do a full proposal. It's a three page executive summary. While somewhat duplicitous, we do do this because I think it helps people kind of put down their thoughts in an organized way. It also lets us know what we actually funded. And here they also had to detail a brief budget of milestones of how they plan to spend the money. Okay, and so the big part that probably the thing that uh, has 90% influence of who gets funded is the investment style pitch the teams give. So we really focus on the aspects of, you know, is there a validated real problem to solve? Does the solution actually match up? You know, does the team have a path to market? Is the market big enough for what they need to do? Will this really move things forward in a way that matters? And, you know, is the team is really the right, the team able to, the right people to move to this next step? So, 
we don't ask people to do fantasy financials. Um, that's really not very helpful to them at this stage. And the pitch is uh, 10 minutes with 15 minutes Q&A. So we have been outside reviewers. I'm a bit of a adherent to a chaos reviewer theory where we have at least six to eight good reviewers I find we get good feedback and good signal on the team. So the reviewers, um, we draw them from local entrepreneurs, successful uh, entrepreneurs, actually people who've gone through this program. We, often, uh, we ask them to come back. We've, done spin outs and other successful things, uh, local investors, and also other members of the local uh, you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So uh, this also partially is a bit of a uh, relation building exercise as well to bring in the mentors. And we also schedule the mentors where they can kind of about usually what hour and a half or two hour blocks they can choose. So um, what we ask the reviewers to do is um, then we have a Q&A, which is often actually a lot of good discussion and advice and uh, questions to the teams Then the mentors, we have them fill out online form, kind of rank the teams in different elements of the pitch, really ask like, do you think we should fund this team? A yes, no, or maybe. And then what especially is valid, we ask the mentors, what's the next important, most important thing the team should do? Uh, that feedback often does influence the ultimate milestones that are set. And then any other advice. So often we do have mentors who do say, yeah, please reach out to me. I'd love to help you more. So that's always great to see. And uh, we, we summarize all that feedback and give it to the teams, which is very helpful. So, uh, and then based on that, we will then make our decisions. All right, next slide, please. So uh, we think to make our awards. So we often go on with the mentors, the views of uh, what they think should be funded. I think they often have collectively very good uh, view viewpoints and tends to be pretty clear the teams that really made a convincing pitch and those who didn't, although we do reserve our own judgment of what to do. I should add that uh, typically in a given cycle, we'll fund eight to 10 teams, $50,000. And uh, we usually also give uh, three, two to three teams, $10,000 or cases just do business, usually more customer discovery where we want them to come back and try again, and try and encourage them to do that. Uh, typically in numbers, uh, applicants, they range from about 30 to 20 in a given cycle. We do usually have some attrition, I'd say of uh, probably depending uh, six to three teams usually drop out over the course of the uh, gap fund. But the awards are one year. Uh, we've instituted a two year maximum just because of drag on, although COVID had lots of exceptions. So I think we've finally worked through most of those. Uh, once a team is funded, we'll sit down with them and we'll review their plan, any comments and try to come up with two to three milestones, which we do tranche. Um, I think this is the main value here is just to provide touch points to the team as they go along. And one area where I think I'd like to see the ways that we could make our interactions more valuable post-grant. Um, we are very flexible in changing milestones and plans. I think that's actually a good thing as um, some things don't work out or sometimes people find that um, there's really other things they need to do. But as long as something's rational, we're pretty open to uh, changing the milestones. Um, and then for the business development activities, I mentioned we don't really require or expect the teams to know what to do with the money initially. Um, one thing there's, we do get a lot of proposals to use the money for customer discovery, often to uh, salary support for a junior member to go do it or to spend time doing our, I, we have a I-Core site program we do twice a year. I uh, have found that uh, uh, after getting too many surveys or people going to conferences and having a good time and not getting much, I do require, them spend a few hundred dollars for some initial strategy training sessions before they go, the local uh, internal consultancy group does. I found that helps a lot in getting a good outcomes. Regular, regulatory consulting is another one, uh, marketing consulting, although I do uh, scrutinize uh, consultant uses of funds quite a bit since I find consultants, the uh, projects tend to uh, match the size of the funding quite often. So we're pretty demanding on pretty clear milestones of what exactly will be done. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as far as funding sources come from, uh, the University Central Administration's definitely the biggest contrib contributor. Uh, the Washington Research Foundation, which has a, it's a long story. It's, I guess you could say it's, a, it's a, a nonprofit venture fund at this point, but they do a lot of gifting. Uh, they also provide substantial funding. There's also this attempt to diversify our funding store sources with uh, these verticals. I think that's been a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, UW Population Health does uh, usually co-fund a couple projects, which is helpful. We had a FinTech 
contract with BECU. Uh, they decided not to continue that for various reasons, but also had a really hard time attracting uh, quality applicants for that. So I think that's a bit of a challenge in verticals is that the fund is very broad and for narrow funding sources is often hard to find good applicants. We have a success payment provision where um, if something is licensed out, uh, then one third of the funding that would go to the um, various stakeholders goes to repay the size, the original award amount. Uh, that's not a huge amount. I mean, it does occasionally happen, but uh, it does help. So, uh, but it certainly is. It's not really an evergreen support uh, source, more of a paying it forward type mechanism. No one's really ever complained about that. All right, next, please. So how have we done? Uh, we've given away a lot of money over the years, 16 million, made a lot of awards. Got split between life sciences and uh, engineering and kind of IT type projects. Um, although I'd say that our tilt is, seems to be going more and more towards life sciences. Um, the um, applicants are dominated by engineering, it's not too surprising. Mm -hmm. Also our engineering departments here seem to love to do uh, health sciences related projects as well. So it's, it tends to be the more of the applied sciences we see that are frequent applicants. Uh, next slide, please. As far as outcomes, uh, the, about a third of the um, projects actually result in something getting out of the university. So had a hundred, over 100 startups, about 12, 26 licenses, and number of direct-to-user projects from usually non-exclusive licenses for uh, copyright-based materials directly from the university. Um, a lot of startups, for major, they have actually managed to raise funding, and a number of them are still active, and a few of them have had good exits. Number of uh, jobs have been created. There's actively, I think there's you know, about 2,000 of currently uh, related jobs to the funds. And they have raised a lot of money, um, $6 billion in dilutive funding, which is huge. Of course, that is dominated by two or three people who've raised a lot of money, but uh, not quite a good large number have actually raised uh, funds after they spun, spun out. So that's an uh, important indicator of success. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So looking forward, uh, I think we're really debating whether we need to increase the award size. I think if we did that, we'd probably get a bit more interesting projects, probably a bit more in the therapeutics as well. Um, $50,000 is not what it used to be. And uh, we're also kind of debating more the, a little bit more educational programming. Particularly teams often, a uh, weak spot is understanding the market and the path to market and business models. That's a, is a bit of a challenge in that, um, there's only so much people that are going to learn. And I think there is some point where this comes too much work for the um, reward. So I think we're kind of close to that line already, but something I'm thinking about. We have debated whether to require teams initially do something like I-Core, uh, our site program, or some other pre-educational program. I think that would drastically reduce our number of applicants because it would require another step. But uh, they do do a lot better the more they've done this. Also, can we make our post-award engagement more valuable? That's a uh, kind of think of. And uh, we've uh, happily moved to uh, Zoom for all our activities. Logistically, it makes things massively easier. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there is something lost. We are debating about whether some parts should be in person again. Our compromise for now is that for the participants, we've been having a celebratory happy hours for all the mentors, reviewers, and teams. So at least there's some chance for some unscripted casual interactions where good things often come from, but uh, that's something we're still wrestling with. Okay, I think that's all I have. I have two questions for you, Ryan, before we move on to Alexandra. Um, one is, a so two questions from the audience. One is, um, are the mentors at Commotion paid or are they volunteers? They are volunteers. Uh, honestly, there is, we found there's no shortage of uh, people who actually want to do this. Um, so the manager mentors probably want to do more if we had more opportunities for them. Um, that's okay. uh, Wonderful. Uh, the next question is um, for the regulatory or a, a consultancy use of funds, does that have to go through the university procurement? And if so, do PI select the consultants then come to you for procurement or is it just on them to figure that out? Or is there yeah. um, a, a bench of pre-approved procured consultants that they can already choose from? Yeah, there is a group of uh, consultants for various purposes that we know, well, uh, we probably should make a, a, a list. Um, well, sometimes people do find their own ones. Uh, we've scrutinized the statement of work quite a bit and often will ask for more details and clarity. And uh, 
Although ultimately that we give the money to the departments and the departments handle the actual procurements. So we're not in that business of uh, actually making it happen. There is a mention that uh, we, we do have a, the, in, an internal consultancy group that is actually a very reasonable and that can do, that does regulatory work. And we've also have uh, teamed up with the uh, regulatory educational programs, which will sometimes do some projects for essentially free or very low cost. Okay, great. Terrific, thank you so much. We will move on to next slide and Alexandra. Right, thank you. Great, thanks Kirsten. So hi everybody, happy to talk about the next fund. Um, so the next fund is a $10 million university gap fund, which provides pre-seed funding to promising early stage faculty startups at Northwestern. Um, and it's worth noting that our funding comes partially from the university's operating budget and also from a financial return of a Northwestern company that had gone public. And so through the next fund, we aim to de-risk technologies um, to a value inflection point so that we can better attract external investors, potential partners, and even customers. Um, I think this group here is quite well aware that university startups often run the risk of falling into that proverbial valley of commercialization death just due to lack of funding and resources. So with the next fund, we really um, aim to bridge that gap. We're also an industry agnostic fund, although we do tend to focus on high growth markets and emerging areas that are in line with the university's innovation mission and priority areas. Just as an example of this, uh, we held an education technology or ed tech focused investment cycle during the pandemic. This was during spring 2021, which as you recall, was a time when the world largely shifted to remote. And so there was this increased interest in uh, developing and funding uh, different types of products and platforms all aimed at facilitating and enhancing remote learning. So let's go to the next slide and dive into some logistics. Um, so we hold a solicitation every year, typically during the spring quarter. In terms of the investment amount, we will usually write check sizes between 50 to 200K, usually settling around 150,000, depending on the milestones. We're very particular about the types of milestones. Um, we'll typically fund key activities related to technical development. Um, so this can be like critical de-risking experiments, pilot testing, uh, prototype development, preclinical studies. But for instance, we won't fund things like marketing expenses, um, employee Northwestern employee salaries, um, and non-technical milestones, et cetera. Um, we uh, structure investments as um, convertible notes, uh, which you can think of as a short-term loan that will either convert into equity in the company upon a qualifying equity uh, round in the future, or uh, will be paid back with accrued interest. Though um, it's worth noting that we're not really here to be debt collectors. Uh, we want the company to succeed and to hit their fundraising milestones. So we'll typically use the maturity date of the note um, just as an excuse to check in on the company, um, figure out how close they are to that equity financing round and do what we can to help them get there. So um, in most cases, we're usually quite happy to actually extend that maturity date if needed. Um, as far as terms go for our convertible note, we are extremely founder friendly. So we don't have a valuation cap. We don't have a discount rate. Our objective is not really to obtain massive outsized returns. Um, we're really so, more so focused on helping our faculty founders and uh, providing that initial injection of capital to really get them going. Uh, as far as next eligibility goes, uh, we require that the startup is founded by a faculty member or at the very least that the underlying foundational IP for the startup is owned by the university. Um, and because of this, we do require that an active option or license agreement be in place um, at the time of receiving next funding. So we've had cases where the next agreement, which includes the convertible note, will actually get executed simultaneously with a license. Um, but we typically do prefer that they have that in place beforehand. Um, we like to think of ourselves as the company's first investor. So usually a sweet spot will be if the company has exhausted traditional grant funding sources, but they're still too early to go out and raise institutional VC dollars. Perhaps there's still some significant product or market de-risking that needs to be done. And so we typically find that if the company is ready to apply or is already applying to um, SBIR funding, those types of sources, then it's also a good time to apply for next funding. Um, and since we do like to come in as the first investor or at least close to the first investor, we usually give priority to companies that have raised less than a million in funding. And that includes both dilutive and non-dilutive um, funding, which can come from sources like angels, friends and family, SBIRs, et cetera. All right, so now that I've covered the basics, um, I'll go ahead and dive into what our evaluation process looks like. 
So uh, let's see, like I said, um, each spring we'll invite eligible startups to submit an initial application. And so we'll have this application go live on our next website, but to help spread the word, we'll do email marketing campaigns to all of our Northwestern inventors, as well as our startups. And then we'll also usually have our invention managers do personal reach outs to the startups that are within their portfolios. We'll typically have a very short Microsoft Forms application that will ask basic questions about the company. So tell us about your core technology, what stage of development you're at, problem you're solving, the value proposition, your business model, how you're gonna use the funds, and perhaps most critically, you know, how is next funding and specifically going to get you to a value inflection point? So we'll do an initial screen internally where decisions will be made by a selection committee that consists of myself, Invo's New Ventures team, and other members at Invo where we'll basically down select from a starting pool of typically around 15 or so applicants to a smaller subset of four to five finalists that we will now take forward into our due diligence process. And so we'll ask those four to five uh, finalists to submit a more complete portfolio of materials that includes a pitch deck. Um, most will actually even provide a guide for like specific information we want them to include in that deck, a capitalization table, as well as detailed milestones. Then we'll assemble a diligence team. And so this will consist of an external investment committee, as well as a next associate to evaluate each opportunity. So next associates are Northwestern graduate students, typically PhD students who are interested in getting exposure to VC. And so we've actually built an internship program around this where we'll train two to three grad students um, each cycle to perform diligence um, for the next fund. And so for each opportunity, in addition to having a next, next associate, um, we'll assign two uh, external investors or industry experts to serve as that investment committee. Um, and that investment committee really serves as our soundboard for making final decisions. And so the diligence process will usually involve the startup formally pitching to the diligence team and allowing us to do a deep dive and really ask all the clarifying questions. And then afterwards, at that point, our next associate will go on to prepare a diligence deck uh, for their assigned companies. And so this diligence deck will usually cover a lot, um, everything from assessing the problem that the company is solving, asking, you know, is their beachhead defined? Are they adding value, addressing an unmet need? We'll take a closer look at the technology, look at the IP, uh, read up on the scientific literature, look at their data. We'll want to understand the commercial landscape. So looking at the market opportunity, how they're differentiating from competitors, we will assess their commercialization pathway, look at their business model, their go-to-market strategy, et cetera. We'll also take a closer look at the team, asking questions like, you know, does this team have the skills and the experience to execute these immediate um, milestones? And do they have the skills to commercialize this technology? And, and if they don't, then we want to make sure that they've at least identified some of those key near-term hires to do so. Uh, finally, we'll take a deeper look at their proposed milestones and how they're planning to use the funds with the guiding question throughout really being, you know, will this funding actually make a difference? And so I'll work pretty closely with the next associates. We'll have weekly check-ins over the summer. I'll provide feedback um, on all the deliverables. And the entire process actually ends up being quite collaborative. We'll also check back in with the companies periodically with follow-up questions just to close any knowledge gaps. Um, and ultimately the associates will prepare around a 20 slide uh, deck um, with what they perceive to be potential risks and opportunities um, ending with their final investment recommendation and a summary of all the reasons for why to invest or why not to invest. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So then the next associate will actually present their diligence deck uh, to the investment committee along with their investment recommendation. Um, and then the investment committee will weigh in, provide their recommendation. And so it's worth noting that while the decisions are ultimately up to Invo, we do rely heavily on our investment committee members to be a soundboard for those decisions. And in fact, we have in the past brought in a third member if we find that two investment committee members are disagreeing, just to get that additional uh, data point. Um, but for the most part, we found pretty solid alignment between what our next associate prepares and what our investment committee actually recommends. It's also worth noting that it's not always a clear cut yes or no. Um, oftentimes we'll identify other areas that we think are more critical for the company to de-risk. And so in those cases, we'll propose back new milestones to try to refocus the company on addressing those more critical risks. Um, we've also started implementing what I call non-funded milestones, which are essentially just other requirements for the company. The major one is uh, requiring all next funded companies to perform 30 or more stakeholder interviews in a customer discovery program like i -Corps. 
And so I, um, I'm connected with quite a few uh, regional i programs. So I'll usually go ahead and reserve the spots for the teams to participate at a time that's convenient for them. And we found that so far, this has been really beneficial in helping the teams really refine their value propositions to their target customers. As far as administration goes, um, so far we've held annual or biannual formal check-ins with the company just to track progression of their milestones with usually some informal check-ins sprinkled throughout. Um, but moving forward, we are planning to actually increase the frequency of these meetings, um, aiming for quarterly meetings all the way until they reach that equity financing. And our, our logic behind this is really, we just wanna keep driving momentum. You know, It's a way to hold the teams accountable and just help intervene earlier if we identify any roadblocks to their progress. Um, regarding other resources that we provide, um, and I should note, these are not exclusive to Next Awardees, but we certainly encourage our portfolio companies to, to pursue these things. Um, we offer lab space um, and working space at a discount at um, the Query Incubation Lab. This is Northwestern's newly launched incubator for research-based startups. And in fact, I believe currently uh, five out of the 10 resident startups at the incubation lab are next portfolio companies. Um, we also have a startup toolkit credit that will reimburse 80% of initial expenses up to $5,000 within three years of the company incorporating. So this is usually something companies use to like defray legal expenses and things like that. We also have a core facilities uh, discount where we'll basically reimburse the difference between the internal and the external rate for using uh, Northwestern core facilities. Um, like I mentioned, we'll connect to various i programs, either offered via NSF or um, NIH um, through NCATS, for instance. Uh, we'll also connect to potential mentors and advisors to provide guidance. Um, and then when the company is ready to begin fundraising, uh, we are, are always happy and more than willing to make warm introductions to VCs within our network. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here's just a quick glance at our next portfolio. Um, we have made in total 17 investments since 2016 when the fund was launched. We actually started with pre-company investments that have since successfully spun into startups. Um, we have also had a few of the companies already go on to raise their qualifying uh, Series C or Series A equity financing round, um, with others making good progress and currently on track to hit their fundraising milestones. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had an EdTech-focused solicitation during the pandemic, which you can see in blue. Um, this allowed the next fund actually to expand beyond typical deep tech and develop workflows for funding copyrightable works and software that are not typically university-owned. Um, and so with EdTech, we made uh, four pre-company investments, but happy to report that two of those projects have recently spun into companies. Um, finally, worth noting that since 2016, we're, we've only really invested around 20% of our fund. So we're pretty fortunate to have a solid reserve of funding left or dry powder, if you will. So we're not really at that point yet that we have to fundraise or really uh, strategize uh, the replenishment of the fund. But um, I will absolutely be coming back to this group with questions uh, when we do get to that point. So I think I'll stop there and um, I'm happy to take any questions or elaborate further on anything that I've shared. Great. We have one question from the audience, Alexandra, um, is a legal entity question. Um, is it a separate fund um, technically outside of the university or is it within the university? And if it's in, within the university, how did um, you overcome pushback regarding nonprofit status at the university while having a fund? Ooh, um, so it is within the university, and I wasn't actually present for the formation of the fund. My predecessor did all of that legwork. We worked very closely with our investment office, though, to set this up and ensure that the agreements that we had in place were all, um, you know, without the, again, um, without the goal, without the objective of, again, trying to gain these massive outsized returns, but instead really a mechanism to support our faculty founders by providing that really critical injection of early capital. So I think there was a lot of probably conversation about what the what the goals of the fund and making sure it's not like a financially driven typical fund. Um, Great, thanks. And then one other question that came in, um, how is this program related at all to new cures? If so, how? Oh, I love new cures. So uh, new cures is a, more of a standard proof of concept program that unfortunately is actually no longer um, in operation, but that was um, a different, a totally different program focused instead on funding um, early stage therapeutics projects um, to help de-risk them and, and get them to a point where they could either be out licensed to 
to pharma companies and other third parties or form the foundation for a startup. Um, so you can see it as a very complementary program. We certainly always would look to, to New Cures projects that were ready to start a company as, um, you know, sort of priming the pipeline for potential next investments. Great. And we have one more question, and then we'll move on to Brian. Um, given that um, it's university funds being used, what is the internal um, view regarding follow-on investments versus the capital solely to support the faculty spinouts with um, early infusion only? So we don't do follow-on. We don't do follow-on uh, follow-on investments. We're not really um, the fund is not really set up for that. Um, we like to our sweet spot again is just in doing the initial injection of capital, and you know like a related point is we wouldn't, we're, our goal is not like to do follow-on funding where we'll need to uh, uh, retain our equity position throughout subsequent rounds. Since again, our goal is not for the financial um, return um, so much as just to get, give the faculty that initial um, boost. Great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Brian, Brian from UJHU, I'm going to try to be consistent with that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, I think, as you'll see, our funds that are a much earlier stage than the, than the prior two funds are much more focused on faculty awards and, and furthering the technology while it's still a university asset. Uh, the mission of our funds is really threefold and very similar. It's to set early stage innovations on a commercialization path. It's to de-risk the technologies and, as a result, to increase the commercial value of those technologies. In terms of Hopkins specific, we've got multiple forms and sources. We have four funds that are internally run. We also have three funds that are, that are externally funded and we're more in an administering role uh, for them. Uh, again, this furthers a university owned asset. This isn't startup funding at this point. And sometimes we have to remind faculty of that very point. It does not dilute future equity. So anyone who receives uh, these awards, there's there's no claim on any startup that would come out of it, though there often is a payback component, and that payback component comes out of economics that would flow to the university. So again, there's there's nothing that a recipient would have to pay back personally or out of their lab into the fund. Benefits are similar to what's been discussed. I think number one is engagement. Oftentimes, this is the first time we're meeting a faculty member, learning about them, learning about their technology learning about their plans for moving forward. Uh, there's a chance for expert feedback. We use external reviewers, so it's great to get that third party uh, look at technologies as well as we also ask among the questions of what specifically should this faculty member be doing as the next step or over the course of the next year. And oftentimes there's a critical reassessment. We'll receive an application where they think there's a certain target market Experiments should be designed a certain way or milestones should be hit. And as a result of the feedback that they get, there are frequent pivots uh, within those items. In terms of the fund operation, there's a call for applications about six weeks before the deadline. The application is five pages long, really outlining the IP, how they see the project, what's the commercial path forward, and then specifically for our funds, which typically run nine months and award up to $100,000, what is it that you plan to do with the money and why is that significant? Again, the, the applications are scored externally, which is very good on two levels. One is we're able to tap expertise that we don't have. It also removes us from the scoring component. So there's no element of if you're not a friend of the tech transfer office, you're not going to get any money. It's, it really is as fair a process and unbiased as we can make it. Uh, we offer to meet with everyone who applies. We also provide them with copies of their reviews. There's no one else we know of that does this. And this is probably, in addition to the money, the most valuable thing they get, because most often faculty grants are simply, uh, you know, you submit it, it's a black hole, and then you get it or you don't get it. And then last but not least, we, we work to get five finalists to present to a separate investment committee. And that committee receives the applications only so that there is no biasing of the judge. So again, we're, we're putting uh, candidates in front of a, a separate group, which again, will make the selection on, on the funds to uh, be awarded. And typically that's two to three awards per cycle. Can I ask Funnies? you a question, Brian? Sure. I apologize. Uh, who's on that committee then, the separate committee? Uh, 
experts of we had we get a, a variety of areas. So you'll have very accomplished people uh, in in uh, therapeutics. We'll have someone in in infotech. We'll have someone in material science. Again, these these are accomplished people who understand science and commercialization. They are the peers of the faculty presenting from a, a background standpoint, as well as have the, the perspective of what does it take to go from an idea to actually a commercial product. Great, thank you. Sure, again, the, the funding sources, we have philanthropic funding, which is both individual as well as corporate. Also the state of Maryland is one of the funds that's external, we administer the Maryland Innovation Awards, which is a terrific program that the state of Maryland set up. In terms of tracking, we track all follow-on funding and licensing activity, and we report out twice a year to the donors, very detailed report on what funding has been received, what commercialization activity has gone on, what progress from the technology has gone, has gone forward, so that they get a very uh, detailed picture of what their, what their money has led to. In terms of best practices, some of the lessons that we've learned is number one was the creation of guides for applicants and reviewers. Uh, for the applicants, this is oftentimes the first time they've written a commercially oriented application. And I liken that to the freshman English 101 problem. If I knew how my faculty member wanted the paper written, I could do it. If I spend the semester figuring out, I'm gonna fail and explain it to my parents. Uh, and also for the reviewers, because again, this is a human process. So how do we get some consistency into how things are viewed and scored. And, and these application guides are right on our website. We read every application before sending them out to make sure there are no issues with intellectual property or other things. Again, you don't want to be sending this outside the university if then suddenly you guys say, oh, never mind, thanks for putting all that work in, it's now not eligible. Clinician input is key. One of the, the members of our team, key members, Dr. Mike Weisfeld, former department of the chair of medicine, head of cardiology. And, and the perspective that he brings, is, it can't be understated. One, he can talk to faculty as a faculty member. He can understand how an idea would translate clinically and therapeutically. And in his knowledge of just how to move something through a university or NIH process, is just proven to be invaluable time after time to our applicants. So again, I think having that clinician input is really key. If I could require one thing somewhere in what's been talked about, it would be to require some kind of this customer discovery or i -Corps type program. You simply can't be competitive with these grants if you don't have a target customer, a use case, value propositions to really elaborate on it in a concise and efficient manner. And then lastly, an issue that's cropped up, especially over the past year, is we're getting reports of invention coming in literally the day before the application comes in. And as you all know, when that comes in, the, the intellectual property managers need time. They need time to meet with the faculty member. They need to time to do some work and analysis, see if they're going to move the intellectual property forward. And it puts us in a tight spot of, you know, it looks interesting, but you really want to put it forward for funding and then find out that there's some kind of issue with the intellectual property. So I think that's something as we go forward, we're going to put a little bit of separation on deadlines, again, just to avoid these types of issues. So with that, that that concludes my, that's a, my presentation. That's a terrific set of best practices. Um, thanks, Brian. We, we have, I have one other question from the audience, and then we have some questions that was submitted to us beforehand that I'm going to ask uh, the, to the group. Um, so for you, Brian, uh, you mentioned that the proposal is scored by one group and presented to another committee. What's the benefit of, uh, of doing uh, each of those? One is, you know, if we have 20 applicants, we're trying to get it down to five. So you're going to have to send that to a to a broader to a broader group, and then you want a second those those five that move forward that are the best. We then spend a lot of time with them to prep them. They'll, they prep for a ten minute presentation, ten minute Q and A session, and so it just it, it it takes more time. The, the benefit of having it separate is you no one is seeing something for the second time. You're getting a, a fresh look from people and. There's, we try to consistently use reviewers for each of these stages, so they're used to doing it. They, they, they know the questions to ask. There's a good dynamic among the, the committee members themselves. And then occasionally, if we need to bring in uh, a one-time person because we've got something in some area where no one really has the expertise, well, the good news for us is there's always people who want to come in and help us out with something like that. 
Great, thank you so much. We're gonna put the um, deck back up just for a second um, because it has our contact information if in case you wanna follow up with any questions uh, to any of us, any of our panelists. Um, and uh, but then we'll take it back down again and um, uh, have a, our our discussion. So copy down anyone you want. We will be sending this deck out to all of you afterwards as well, though. So you will have uh, the contact information for our panelists as well afterwards. Um, we had a number of questions that came in beforehand, um, and and a couple of the questions were around um, keeping a fund uh, green and how that is supported. And, uh, you know, Ryan, you had mentioned that when you license out, I think that like a third of um, uh, the amount that's licensed out for can go back to the fund. But I'd love to hear, are there any other thoughts about um, keeping your, your funds evergreen? I know um, uh, Alexandra, also with your fund right now, you have, you have enough funds to last you for a while, but have you thought about, uh, keeping it evergreen as well? So maybe I'll start it with you, Alexandra, and then Brian and Ryan, if you want to talk about uh, your experiences as well. Yeah, no, happy to. So, um, like you mentioned, Kirsten, we're in a very fortunate position where we've like barely, um, made a budge in our, our available funding. Um, but certainly like we use a convertible note structure that has a repayment obligation. So at the very minimum, while there's two scenarios, the company could unfortunately go to zero and then there's no company or entity to repay back uh, what the loan that they took from us. But in other scenarios, the company could simply, you know, get to the maturity date um, and not have yet raised a qualifying financing round and maybe they even actually would prefer to repay back the loan. And so getting that one X return would be a way of replenishing the fund and just at least re you know recouping that initial investment. Um, but I don't think we've got too much ahead of that at this point. Great. Thank you. Ryan or Brian, do you have any comments? For ours, it's it's spelled out directly in the uh, in the in the grant agreement or the memorandum of understanding, so that they know there will be a, you know, if you get a hundred thousand dollars, the first two hundred thousand dollars of proceeds to the university will come back into the fund to keep it evergreen. So that's that's made clear up front. Thanks. Yeah, I think for us, uh, at least at this moment, uh, making sure that our stakeholders are happy, um, namely University of Washington. The Washington Research Foundation is a key. Um, one thing we're thinking of doing is uh, we never actually asked people about um, other types of follow-on funding, like grants to the university. I think if we start tracking that, I think there is a lot of that money, then that makes another argument to the university that this is actually net positive for the university anyway. So I think really articulating the value of it's uh, has been critical, but um, it's something we do think about a lot. Well, and so that actually goes to the next question then, which is about the kind of the value that you're showing, the goals and the metrics that you have um, for your particular fund. Are there um, are things that the university sets with regards to metrics or that you set with regards to metrics for your um, fund? And you know how are those um, perhaps perceived or, or viewed by others? Uh, Brian, I'll start with you on that particular question. We, we we capture all those metrics and report back to them to the donors. I think the interesting part for us is that, you know, we don't select the finalists. We don't select who gets the award, but in the end, we have to report how well they do. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's interesting, but again, we've, we've had good results. The fund that's been around the longest is probably given away about a million seven and that's translated into just under 4 million in grant funding and over 30 million in venture funding. So considering the stage of this, uh, I think that's pretty good. And again, it shows the quality of work done by our reviewers and the selections made by the investment committee. Right. And so basically showing that, you know, putting the money into these has helped them gain that further funding um, uh, from those different areas. That's a, that's a terrific metric to be using, uh, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, from you, Deb. And try to be better about that. <laughs> yeah, um, those are just track similar metrics, um, which I think is persuasive. Also, um, particularly the Washington Research Foundation, because they all tend to have later stage programs. They're very interested actually in the comments that our teams get, and that because they, they like to learn from that because they'll see a lot of the same people asking for their one hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollars grants down the road. So that's we found actually there's a, there's a lot of synergy for uh, other partners who have different programs from what's learned. Alexander, anything you want to comment on about the metrics? 
Yeah, you know, I think going back again to the mission of the next fund, we're really our goal, our mission is to get uh, these companies to that next value inflection point. Um, and so at this stage, we're primarily measuring whether or not the companies go on to raise that qualifying uh, equity round as sort of the key performance indicator of, of you know, where that investment went. Um, but, you know, we've only had so far three companies uh, make it to that point out of our 17. So we're still pretty early on in this life cycle. But there's other things we can measure, other value inflection points, like, for instance, if it's a therapeutics company, does it get to that IND readiness stage? Um, maybe it's that, you know, a company gets its first purchase order from a main, a major customer or establishes a key partnership with a key industry player. So there's a lot of um, those types of milestones that we're looking at right now. Great. We have hit the one hour mark. We are going to go keep um, keep going with a few more questions um, that we do have uh, from from our audience uh, from from that they were sent in to us beforehand. We realize that a number of people are going to need to leave. That is all right. We're recording this. Uh, we'll be providing to you afterwards. So um, if you need to to go to another meeting, obviously, um, please feel free to do so. But we are going to stay on for a few more minutes to ask uh, answer these uh, additional questions. Um, one of those, actually, Jamie, I'm going to direct to you. Um, it was about uh, what percentage of universities have these funds and how much on average do they invest in proof of concept funding uh, per year? And I know you've been doing some research on this. I don't know if we know exactly the percentage, but um, could you answer the, the basics of that question? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so we don't have the exact stats to um, illustrate right now. Um, I will say, as we said, we've done a, a, a relatively extensive search of proof of concept funds at universities. We found oh, about 60 um, proof of concept funds or different universities that have per, um, proof, of, proof of concept funds. Some universities have multiple like uh, JHU. But once again, what that's presented to all the universities that there are, we don't know, but it's a good section and it's um, very geographically diverse. You know, a lot of different universities that um, having these funds. Typically, what I have found is that these funds raise a giveaway between 50 to 150 K um, in their funding. Per project. Per per project. Pro yes, okay. per project. They'll make multiple awards, you know, based on their funding source. Um, whether what that total amount is across all these funds, I don't have. Um, the other thing I will mention is if you go to Nuvasource um, website, they do have some stats there. Once again, I can't speak to how they calculate those stats, but um, that's another source you can go to if you want to find out more. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to ask a question about when you were establishing your funds, and I know that you guys have been there at different time periods, and maybe weren't around, but maybe you know. So, when you know, a lot of people are still looking at establishing their funds. Were there any resources that you particularly used um, besides, you know, obviously Nova Source is a, a terrific resource source out there. But are other other resources that you used in establishing um, your funds? And Ryan from UDEV, I'll start with you. Um. Yeah, I think in 2005, it might have been a bit more of a radical idea. Um, I think definitely the goal though was to try to move from just IP asset creation to actually more of the trend to you know, increasing the value of those assets. Um, and certainly, um, I think we always try to look this other program since um, places where we kind of see, see gaps where you know a bit of targeted funding can make a big difference. And also we do a lot of benchmarking what other people are doing, but I, I feel that even though we established it, that it's changed so much over the years as we've learned what works and doesn't work and things like, um, you know, customers discovering i -Corps, that really changed how we did things too and the emphasis. So it, it's, a, we're always messing with something. I'd say it's a really continuous cycle of change, but um, I think starting anything new, I think the, to get your stakeholders in line and supportive and make sure you, they, they see the value, I guess would be the advice for anyone who's uh, embarking on this. Alexandra, any resources in particular that were helpful to you? Well, I wasn't actually involved in setting up the next fund, but I can maybe speak to resources that were helpful in sort of uh, taking on the reins of the next fund. I, I came with a background of having actually been one of these next associates myself and done the diligence. So I, I got that view, um, but then joining and taking over more of the administration and the execution, there was certainly like a learning curve in terms of understanding all of this um, venture terminology, what are stand, what's a convertible note, what to save, like what are standard 
deal terms. So uh, certainly um, I recommend reading books like Venture Deals by Brad Feld. There's a lot of great online free resources for just helping demystify venture capital in general and ensure that you're, you can be conversant in a conversation. And, and you know what are, you know, you have some reference point for negotiating since uh, it's, all of our terms are negotiable. Thanks, Alexander. Brian, from, from JHU. <laughs> yeah, our, our funds are in existence and we're, we're part of an overall plan that was put in place a, a, a decade ago, but I, you know, they varied in amounts and so forth. Uh, I think one of the early learning lessons applied was, you know, with all the faculty I have going on, if they can't get at least $100,000, it's going to be hard to get their attention. So I think that was one of kind of the early things that one of our, our donors for the engineering school specifically, when we talked to him about that, he was he was willing to make those changes. And I think he's seen the results of that. So I would just say, again, there's faculty, you got to make it worth their time. And six figures seems to hit that threshold. That's a really good point. Thank you, Brian. Um, one other question about, and actually this goes, references something that you just said, uh, Ryan from UW, is what are some don'ts you learned along the way or some some uh, pitfalls that you would advise others uh, to try to avoid? So I'll start with you, uh, Ryan from UW. Yeah, I think just one is uh, try to make something that's uh, manageable for you. I, I think that is, there's a constant struggle just between getting things done and just, manage, just keeping the process, not being murdered by it. Um, and so I, I really struggle by trying to, as much as I can to find things that can be done without me necessarily doing them. But I think that's always just, it's just, I think a tech transfer in general. So there's always more to do. There's people to do it. Um, I think also just uh, with the people involved, make sure you have good alignment with. Um, just, um, you know, I think some, I think most faculty members have now figured that this is something to do, you care about commercialization. It's not really a good place to look for fuel to, feed the machine, keep the lab going. It's, you know, the, but um, I think sometimes that's been a struggle we've had. And the, I think we're highly dependent on mentors and volunteers and you know, their needs are important too. So like keeping everyone expectations in line, I think is very valuable. Right. Uh, anything else? Brian. I'd also say uh, automated messages are your friend. Uh, I'll say that. Um, oddly enough, the computer sends a message, people tend to do it. If I tell them, they tend not to. So I, it's kind of seems backwards, but that's another thing I found um, also makes life easier. Great. Brian, some, uh, Brian from UJHU, some do's and don'ts. I think what we learned was to standardize the processes. That, that's, that's the key. And a lot of faculty will ask, you know, am I ready? What should I do? And the value of the, the guide we have is I can point them to the guide and say, how well can you answer these questions? And let's talk about the ones that you can try to help you figure out how to get answers. I, I think that the biggest one we learned was making sure reading all the applications and really going through them and taking the time because you just you can't have something move forward and then find there's a fatal flaw. Then you, you got a lot of knots to untie, as I like to say, and I'd prefer not to do that. Great. Alexander, we'll finish off with you. Sure. Um, okay, so I've learned a few things. Um, I would, if possible, avoid awarding um, funding in just one lump sum. Uh, we found through some trial and error that it's better to tranche the funding if possible and just make it milestone dependent. It better incentivizes deliverables, holds teams better accountable. We actually piloted this with our ed tech um, solicitation and it worked really well. Our teams really stayed um, on task and motivated. So we're now porting this this workflow over for our startups. Um, also, uh, don't, and this has been echoed throughout, but don't just provide funding and nothing else. Um, early stage teams, it's they need an incredible amount of support. So I encourage everyone to dig into their networks, offer to make introductions to folks that have a track record of success. Um, and even just like-minded peers, being a founder CEO, we've learned can be incredibly lonely. Um, so just even having, you know, cultivating that network for, for moral support as you're getting started. Um, also, as we've all been echoing to, encouraging them to participate in like free online resources like i programs um, to really nail down their problem solution fit um, and also doing uh, frequent uh, check-in meetings. Um, I will also add for at least our fund where we are doing investments, and this can be a new type of language for our first time faculty founders, don't like assume prior understanding of these investment structures like convertible notes. 
it's really critical to explain the terms thoroughly and more than once and emphasize just a thousand times that the funding is not a grant. Um, I'll also just say um, one, something we've also learned is um, it's important not to be swayed by really exciting technologies that may have somewhat of a weak team in place to lead it. Um, it's important to trust your gut about the team. There've definitely been instances where our strong belief in the technology um, kind of overrode the, the red flags we were seeing and the, the actual teams that were leading the effort. Um, so this is one thing that I would caution folks um, uh, running their own funds. And then I'll, I'll just end with, um, if you're looking for hands, like uh, sets of hands to help with the diligence, um, don't underestimate graduate students for helping do this. Um, they are ex excellent at helping evaluate um, early stage opportunities that often uh, bear more technical risk than anything else. And so they have that scientific um, and technical depth to really deep dive um, into the literature. They have that intellectual curiosity to ask the right questions. Um, you know, I think, MBA students can be great as well, but the other point to make here is that they often have more opportunities to like intern with venture funds, graduate students who are looking for alternative career paths. This might be a completely brand new world to them. So this is another way to help set them up for some alternative careers. Terrific. With that, we will um, end the webinar. I wanna thank uh, our panelists today for joining us, Alexandra, Ryan, Brian, uh, Jamie, we did uh, note again the um, survey link uh, to provide us feedback on today's webinar as well as make suggestions for future webinars. One like this was actually one that came from one of our partner institutions. Thank you, Northwestern, for making the suggestion uh, that we do these case studies today and talk about the operations. If you do have follow-up questions for our panelists, please do reach out to them. They are happy to talk about their uh, programs, uh, what they've learned along the way, how they're running them. And we um, welcome also uh, like I said, the suggestions that you may have uh, for our future webinars as well. Thank you again all for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.